A man chooses, a slave obeys. Welcome to the Ethics and Video Games podcast, where we explore issues at the intersection of ethics and video games. What follows is a series of graphic, interactive scenes that we can't show you. Hello, everybody. We're here with Ashley Guajardo and Ann Johnson. Um, today, this is our first episode uh, with two guests, our first four-person episode. Um, we're going to talk about, essentially, uh, the ethics of video game research, a topic uh, that is incredibly interesting and one that we've never remotely touched on. And I think uh, that most people know very, very little about. This is one of those things that I think kind of uh, takes place uh, behind the scenes uh, as far as most of us who play video games are, are concerned. So Ashley Gojardo is an associate professor of entertainment, arts, and engineering at the University of Utah. We love the University of Utah. Can you tell? How many guests have we had for the University of Utah? You guys are awesome. You do such cool things. We're party uh, people. And you're party people. Uh, where she teaches game design and game user research. Uh, when she isn't researching Twitch streamers or Twitch streaming herself, she serves on the Institutional Review Board, uh, which is what we're here for, uh, and is cur currently co-directing co the uh, Hashtag Games you are Summit uh, 2020, the largest conference for games users researchers. And, and, when people ask Anne what her dream job would be, her answer is always the same, making one-of-a-kind clothes, and she's here to do that for you. Um, <laughs> maybe not. Uh, but she loves the creativity and artistry that pours out of her when designing and sewing clothings, and yet she's a scientist at heart and by profession. Uh, she has degrees in biology, chemistry, bio biology, chemistry, and public health. Uh, and her career is making sure people who volunteer to be in research studies are as safe and as respected as possible. She's a director of the University of Utah's IRB and Human Research Protection Program. Uh, you guys sound amazing. Ashley and Ann, welcome to the show. Yeah. Yay! Thank you. Thank you. So, okay, so, uh, and let, let's start with you. Uh, what is an IRB board, right? So uh, I want to do a research project involving video games. What does that have to do with you? How, how do I encounter you? Yeah, so an IRB, Institutional Review Board, the easy way of saying that is we're an ethics committee. And we're an ethics committee that looks at the ethics of research. And we don't look at the ethics of any, just any research. It's only the research that's done on human beings. So living human beings. So there's clearly a lot of research out there that could be done on a lot of different things, but we are looking at it in the context of humans. And so we are trying our best as a group of people to decide if research is keeping people safe, but it's also being done fairly. What does that mean? And so I'm doing a research project on video games. What kind of things do I need to worry about? Let's, let's talk about safety first, and then let's talk about fairness. And I'm, sure, I'm assuming fairness is going to be a lot more complicated than safety. Um, I was going to give uh, the insight from someone who studies games. In terms of safety, we have safety designations at the Institutional Review Board that determine whether or not a study is minimal risk or greater than minimal risk. For the most part, video game studies tend to be minimal risk, meaning that we're not like poking people with needles. We're not like injecting them with stuff to see what happens. Uh, we're not necessarily exposing them to things that they would encounter outside of their daily life. Most of the time when we are researching games, we are uh, researching groups of people that would already play games. Not always, but most of the time. So this mm -hmm. is nothing outside of their ordinary day. Um, so in that case, we're classified as minimal risk, um, but it is still human subjects research with some exceptions. If we're doing like what my games user research lab does, we're actually doing product research. And so that doesn't meet the federal guidelines for human subjects research in quite the same way. We're not mm -hmm. studying to make generalizable data about a population. We are studying just a product and the product in development. And we're trying to make that product better. 
So um, it kind of it's similar to like student evals, right? Student evals of your classes are a type of research, but uh, you're not going to go and write research papers based off of that data. You're going to use it to improve your pedagogy and your teaching. Um, so in that case, where video games are pretty minimal risk, but if you are asking people questions, you definitely need to seek IRB approval. Um, outside of product development because mm. we want to make sure that you're not causing harm. So in this case, if your video game happened to have uh, a component which might bring up um, emotional feelings that would not necessarily be encountered in daily life or dealt with topics that folks might find disturbing, then at the minimum, we would want you to tell people so that they can make an informed choice and consent to that research rather than just kind of springing it on them um, mm -hmm. covertly. But of course, covert research can happen and it can happen ethically, but we, there, there are safety protocols in place to ensure uh, that people are not harmed as a process to, to gather data. So both both physically and or and or emotionally harmed. Yeah, so physically mm -hmm. we don't, I mean, with most games, asterisks, course exceptions, mm -hmm. we're not doing a whole lot of physical research. Of course, mm -hmm. the exception being virtual reality. Um, and then there's physical concerns about uh, running into things, <laughs> right. losing balance, falling over, especially when we get into VR studies in physiology, not, not looking at can we make a really cool VR game, but can we use VR for phantom limb pain, right? Can we use oh, VR to treat, right. um, in place of an analgesic or an anesthetic, can we use VR to manage pain, right? That's a question that if you do a quick library search, it comes up in a lot of medical journals um, and pain management journals. And it's a really interesting question, but mm -hmm. you know, what kind of physical concerns do we have with, with VR? And if you, if you read the headset, I didn't, I'm, I'm not going to lie. Um, we have an HTC uh, a VR kit here. Uh, I think we have the HTC Index um, at my house. And I never read the, the safety warning because, mm. you know, I'm an adult. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's like, I, that's when you should read the safety right. warnings, right? But, um, so I sat down to read them because I actually prepared a presentation for this for the IRB. And there are things that I never considered. Um, so in addition to the balance stuff, which like, or hitting a ceiling fan, right? Those, those things I had considered, but... Uh, VR has been correlated. Uh, I don't know that we've established a causational relationship with it, but with myopia, so nearsightedness, oh. particularly in really? kids, having a screen so close to their eyes with light oh, is yeah. showing developmental um, problems with, with eyesight. And of course, motion sickness, I, I anticipated, but um, I didn't know this. So because the headset rests on your sinuses, it can actually exacerbate cold uh, and flu and sinus symptoms. Oh, interesting. So if you're, if you're getting sick and you use VR, you can feel more sick or it can, it doesn't give you a cold, right? So for a while, people right. were thinking, oh, it's because we're sharing headsets, we're all getting sick. But actually, what we think is actually happening is that it's just putting pressure on your sinuses. So it's making your nose run more. And, and so there are like some minor safety concerns like that. Um, hmm. So is that the sort of thing that if, you know, if I'm doing research on, uh, you know, on VR and I'm, you know, um, on a VR game and I'm going to have them wear a headset, uh, I should let them know ahead of time if you have a cold, this is going to av potentially aggravate your systems. And do I need to let them know that long term use of VR devices have been shown to uh, increase myopia in kids? Is that the idea? Something like that? Yeah, so that becomes a really interesting question. And in the past, I've I've defaulted to advising the researchers to read what it varies by headset, right? But for example, I want to say the Oculus says no one under the age of eight should be using the headset. And that's because mm. of these studies on ocular development. Oh. Can, can, can I just say, Ashley, that uh, I've been looking for an excuse to not let my son use my Oculus. And well, that, that's the <laughs> worst part, right? Because you have this shiny piece of tech that kids want, and you're like, "No, your eyesight." You know, now I've got my excuse that that I needed, which is which is just great. There's plenty of other games he can play that are fantastic for him. He doesn't need to use my VR headset. <laughs> <laughs> so in this case, the advisory I give to um, research teams is to adopt the language that's used in the headset devices themselves. So if the company is saying, hey, look, we don't think that people of this age should be using this product, then you have to take that into consideration when when conducting research with that product. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. To go back to the other sort of content warning, right? So 
Uh, let's say um, I want to measure reactions to games like Ethnic Cleansing. So Ethnic Cleansing, we've talked about before in this game, right? Uh, essentially, it's a racist game. It, if, if it doesn't sound like a racist game, I don't know what does. Do I have to inform my, uh, st my study subjects ahead of time that you are playing a game that will have racist elements? Do I need to give them the title? H how much do I need to protect them kind of a, uh, against this? I think that's a really good question. Um, when we look at, you know, harm, we've just talked about like all these physical harms to people, but there's also like that whole vast array of like psychological harm, social harm, harm within, you know, relationships and maybe legal harm mm -hmm. um, that could come to you depending on, you know, certain things that you do in life and potentially in research. And so when we look at harm that could come to research subjects, we've got to take all of that into account. Um, and I think we could all agree that there's a difference in the new harm that's introduced in a research study from someone who's never played, let's say, this racist game before versus someone who's been playing it prior to ever being in a research study. So mm -hmm. that's something for us to think about, too, is should we expose new people to playing this racist game? Interesting. Or should we maybe mm -hmm. recruit people that have already been playing it? They're already doing that harm to themselves, whether they perceive it as harm or not. Um, and so picking the right population that is going to receive less harm from our research is something that we would want to consider as well. But then, right. just as you've said, we would want to be able to talk about any harms that are going to come from being in our study with the person before they say yes or no to doing whatever we're asking them to do. You, you know, it strikes me that uh, in play in having my study subjects uh, play a game like this, I'm kind of looking to see if it harms them. Is you know, and I'm assuming lots of <laughs> studies. I mean, that's kind of the point of the study to see if the product or the subject matter or something harms my subjects. But your job is to make sure I don't harm my subjects. How does how does that work? I think that that is also really fundamental. Is in understanding what IRBs do is we can't always get rid of all the harm of a research right. study, right? Some studies are just risky. So if we took the example of, say, a new medical drug that was going to treat some new condition, that those doctors are also trying to see if this new drug harms you, because it might. Right. Um, but they're also trying to see if it benefits you. And I think right. that is the other key component that we can apply over to video game research as well. Yes, it is important to understand if certain video games or certain contexts that we play within are harming people. But what's the benefit? Mm -hmm. is, there, is there some benefit you're trying to get out of the research? Like, are you trying to show that this harm is bad, that we should limit harm in society? You know, that's a benefit to society potentially, right? right. But if we're just trying to see if things harm people just for the sake of seeing if they harm people... Perhaps that's not <laughs> ethical, right? So it's that risk-benefit balance that we're trying to assess. And it's not just risk to me as a person, but it's risk to people around me. Not just the mm -hmm. benefits to me as a person, but also the benefits to society around me. So we've got to weigh all of that, which can get really complicated. Um, but we've got to consider both sides. Do you have any kind of systematic ways of weighing that? I mean... You know, it seems like a really tough challenge to to figure stuff like this out. And you can yeah, again feel free to use the the racist game example I just gave you. Is what would you do with that? I have no idea what I would do with that. Uh, you know, but then again, I'm not. You know, I'm not in your position. Right. So I think you know one of the one of the things that actually makes medical research easy is we can measure harm a lot better. I won't say better, right. but maybe in quantifiable ways. So like I can see if like I give you this drug or I do this surgery on you, I can see like how it affects your, your heart rate. I can see how it affects your blood chemistry. Like I can measure those things, right? When we're talking about other kinds of harm, the harm is actually really subjective. So if we take right. like a racist video game, right? You could argue, and this is a very, I'm going to say this in a, you know, very simple way, because there's a lot of complexity to racism. I am a white woman. I don't experience racism like a black woman right. experiences racism, right? You could argue I don't experience racism at all. So 
the population that we're studying actually matters and the harm could be different depending on who you are. And so that's something that we have to take into account as well when we're doing the research. There's also the benefit could, to me could be different than the benefit to say a black woman for studying this. So yeah. I think thinking about it in that way is important too. Okay, great. Let me go now back to the issue of fairness. All right, you talked about uh, fairness in, in, in two ways. So, uh, you know, let's keep it simple. I want to know if uh, how receptive players will be to this new game mechanic that I've introduced to VR games. Why, why not? VR games seems like such a great area of study. What do I need to consider in terms of fairness? So now this is a product development, right? So this is, this, mm -hmm. for me, this is really interesting because for some reason we have this idea that if research doesn't meet the federal guideline for what research is and you don't have to go through an IRB, then you can just do what you want, <laughs> which is not true. Like the, mm. these, these principles of research ethics should still apply regardless of whether or not you need to go and fill out a form with an institutional review board. Um, so I see this quite often in terms of playtesting. So mm -hmm. we know that there is a, we, okay, I shouldn't say we know because I, I don't know of any uh, uh, quantifiable uh, peer reviewed study on this, but as, as someone who directs a, a research summit, for at least for this year and has been to the research summit for user research and product research on video games. Um, we, there's a, been a historical bias in who is selected for, for play testing, um, being usually white and male. Um, when, and there's, there's right. anecdotal examples of this, that, you know, stories that people tell about, um, even from the other side of, uh, going in for play testing and assuming that the boyfriend was there to play test and, and the woman wasn't interested in play test. She just drove her boyfriend there or something when, when she was right. in fact the person who was selected to do the play testing. So in this case, um, we have this issue of justice, which is one of the principles I think I mentioned previously of, of the Belmont report, um, which was the Belmont report and, and, and my details on this are a bit shaky. It was written in 1972 which uh, grew out of this desire to have a formalized government document that says what is, what is good research in terms of ethics. Uh, one of the principles there is justice, which hints at what Anne was saying previously about participant selection. So while you may be you may have a really good reason for selecting a certain group of participants, even in video game studies, right? So if, for example, you want to see if your new game is colorblind friendly, it makes sense to pick participants who have colorblindness, right? right like that's, right. that's, you are excluding people, yes, but are you excluding people for a good reason? Also, yes, right. because you want to make your game more accessible. So in that case, the most just thing to do would be to pick people with colorblindness to make your game more colorblind accessible. Um, but if you're excluding people because of convenience, which is the problem we see, I think, across research studies, um, and, and I know Anne has more to say on that <laughs> later. Uh, but when you're excluding people because it's difficult to reach them, because they don't speak English as a primary language, because uh, they might live far away, because you're, you're a game studio that's located in a city and uh, people that you might want to research are out in the suburbs and so transportation is difficult, should you exclude them because it's difficult? Probably not. You should probably try and work out a way that they can still participate because you're interested in, in a, a diversity of opinions, right? So the idea of justice is that the, the barriers to entry to participate in research should be lowered and or equal for everyone. Your race, your gender, your faith, your economic status shouldn't inhibit you from participating in, in research, even if it's just, just quote unquote, product research. Right. Right. Yeah. And, it, and if, I, if I could add to that as just like some thoughts about society in general, one of the questions that comes up for IRBs is how much do we need to try to make research fair when the world is unfair? Right. Right. Yeah. And so are we holding ourselves to a standard to try to correct the world's injustices 
in, in a way that maybe isn't realistic. Um, but I think one of the things that is really important to think about is there have been research studies that have perpetuated injustices. And often the reasons why something is inconvenient to do in research is because it's inconvenient in society. And so are we just continuing to perpetuate that inconvenience, perpetuate that injustice that comes? Um, and so research definitely has to consider conveniences. We can't there's not a lot of money all the time to study all the things in perfectly just ways. And yet, if the goal is to put benefit out into society based on the research that you're doing, the goal probably also should be to make society a little bit better, a little more just alongside of that. So I, I think that this has hit IRBs a little harder in the last decade with with renewed social justice movements that have mm -hmm. gone on in the United States and internationally, where we can't sit back and not listen to these voices anymore. We need to actually care about that social injustice that, that certain communities are experiencing so that as we do research, we can help in the small ways. We can't do it all, but help in smaller ways for those injustices to be overcome in our society. Mm -hmm. Amen. So an, an example like that would be like, you know, we run our we run these tests only during work hours. And so, you know, and we're when we're looking to to test people who are, you know, 20 to 30 years old, that's probably when they're working uh, or they're or they're, you know, rich. It's harder for me to translate to video games. I'm hoping you know, uh, Ashley, you could help translate to video games, but I was thinking sure. about classic things like medical research that ends up being only on men, uh, and thereby <laughs> essentially, you know, the product is released, and then, uh, you know, women are not really protected in the same way as men are because uh, they were never included as part of the study. Well, that's right. that's VR, baby. <laughs> Whoa, <laughs> so really? virtual reality is a really fun example of that because motion sickness disproportionately impacts women. But even so, I had no idea that it was that it was gender related at all. Women are disproportionately affected by motion sickness, and we know that that's exacerbated by certain factors in games like uh, you know movement. If you're a seated VR game versus standing VR game, mm -hmm. um, and then if you have a frame rate drop, <laughs> so mm -hmm. if your your game is uh, jarring or or glitchy at all, that's going to really trigger motion sickness. And so you're making a product that about a quarter of the population cannot access. Will just be incredibly sick if they access it, and I. Either people don't know that, right? Which it's not common knowledge, or people are no. like, "Oh well, you know, oh well." <laughs> and it's like, but you're excluding this massive percentage of the population from yeah. your product. And and if your testing obviously doesn't include women, you will never find this out. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Right. So in in a lot of ways, it's very similar to the medical research, right. which is only studied men. Right. Yeah, that's really interesting, right? Uh, I'm I'm a woman. I you know I I get my Oculus Quest. You know I'm a you know. I, I want to play my game and I can't figure out why I can't do this. And so I'm made to suffer simply because when the researcher did their did, did their study, they just didn't include people like me. Yeah. And there's some really great, um, just as a, an aside. So if there are women out there listening who are triggered by motion sickness in, in VR, there are a couple pro tips that I've discovered. I get motion sick very easy. And so see, sitting down, finding games in VR that are seated helps me mm. and putting a fan on. Really um, cool. So having a, a box fan that you can direct at your face, it's, it's kind of the same effect. I also get seasick. So for me, it feels like right. when you're on a ship and you go above deck to get fresh air, it feels like that in VR oh. for me. So that's helpful. But sorry, that was a tangent. <laughs> is this a personal hack that you've come up with or is this something that has been researched because, uh, I mean, we're talking research here. Yeah, I wish I yeah. were that clever. Um, that actually came out of the Games User Research Summit. Uh, and the video is on, I can give you the link. Um, it's on uh, YouTube. And I can give you the citation as well. I'll have to look that up. But uh, cool. yeah, so some, yeah. some great uh, research pro tips uh, are shared at the Games User Research Summit uh, every year on, on how to make your playtesters more comfortable while they are uh, testing games. While they're getting sick. <laughs> Right. Well, You'll be comfortable, but <laughs> though it's uh, interesting because it means that uh, unless you pass that on that information on to players later on, 
right? What you're testing on is ideal conditions that aren't going to apply to the two regular play conditions. And that happens in medical research as well, right? Where we have these really confined conditions and it doesn't translate into the real world. And so same with same with video game research. Yeah, that's fascinating. So we, we've talked a lot uh, at this point about, you know, we've talked about some about fairness, some of the concerns we have. We haven't actually talked a whole lot uh, about the range of kind of uh, video games research projects. And I'm just kind of curious if, number one, you could tell us about uh, some of the ways that video games are researched. And number two is some of the ways where maybe the morally right uh, thing is not always the practical thing to do. There's so much. I can't even... <laughs> I think, I think I did a, a library search recently. I was looking specifically at VR studies, and there was over a million results. Like, wow. So when you try to narrow down by date, there's just people are doing so much really interesting stuff. Um, so one, one thing that might be interesting, this is an example I actually give my students in, in class to think about morality, practicality, and eth research ethics is, say, for example, you were developing a mobile game for teenagers and there's like a social media component and uh you know this is a fictional game this game does not exist mm -hmm. this is just a thought experiment what if you were you're studying to find out how fun the game is how how appealing it is you're not doing anything controversial you're not the game isn't controversial either it's uh right. you know, i it's a farm game because I'm using really bad examples right now. <laughs> um, we'll do, okay, let's do something more creative. Uh, it's a furniture crafting game. What could go wrong with that? There's sure. nothing controversial about this. But what if you have a chat feature and what if in one of your research reports, a participant says that they're being bullied and harassed? What if that participant says, please don't tell my parents, I don't want them to take this game away. I really enjoy the game, but I'm getting bullied and I'm, I'm scared. What do you do? Well, in my case, it's easy. I'm a mandatory reporter. Mm, right. <laughs> right? The state says I have to tell them. Um, but in, in anyone else's case, that might be a real moral quandary. So what is legal? What do you legally have to do? Well, that's a, that's a gray area. Uh, could the parents turn around and sue if you didn't tell them? Uh, I mean, people, particularly in the United States, can sue for just about anything. Would it go anywhere? I don't know. Is there precedent? I don't know. I'm not a legal expert, right? Um, is it if if you tell the parents, is that morally appropriate? You've just taken this child's game away. And that could have been the child's only outlet for socialization. Um, if you don't tell the parents and the child continues to get bullied and it affects their self-esteem or something worse happens, then what have you mm -hmm. done? Have you, have you been negligent in your role as a game developer? So this is, this is an example that I do not have a clear example um, of. I do not know of a precedent where this has come up. This is kind of just a thought experiment I like my right. students to kind of struggle and grapple with. Um, but yeah, I'd like to hear what Anne has to say. Yeah, I think that that's a great example of what's legal, but what's the, actually the right thing to do, right? And, and we grapple with that. Our laws don't always dictate the right thing to do. Um, mm -hmm. But here, here's, a, here's a kind of flip that another example on its head in terms of there may be something that we would all agree is morally right to do. So the concept of informed consent, you know, you, mm -hmm. you say that and you're like, yes, that, that, is a, that is a great principle. We want to respect people by letting them have informed consent and choose, you know, what they want to do based on good information. Consent is obviously your ability to say yes or no and making a choice. But the informed part means you had good information to make that choice with. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I think that that's important. But so again, informed consent sounds like a great thing. And you would think, yes, everyone should give informed consent for all the things that they do. But think about the practicalities of that. It's, it can be really challenging to sit, let's say you're trying to study a video game and you're trying to look at the data of thousands of players. Getting true informed consent, other than just those terms and conditions you check the box next to when you sign up for you know using a game, to actually right, and get informed and nobody consent, reads. Exactly. It's yeah. actually, it's really impractical. Um, and so we like to think that we've gotten informed consent by having that those terms and conditions and blah, blah, blah. But we're all openly admitting we're not reading it. So we're not informed. We gave consent, but we're not informed. So, you know, that is a real to life practicality that 
means we're not honoring something that we morally think is right, but because it's impractical, we don't care. You know, and where's that balance? Normally we say, well, it's your res- we're giving you the opportunity to become informed. But we know that you're not really taking that opportunity. So we really know you're not informed. But it was but the you know, the ethical part was to respect your agency by giving you that opportunity. But of course, you know, as classic would you know, any kind of medical situations, even if you or or any legal document I ever sign ever, right? There's also the limitations of actually having the capacity to be informed uh, and understand uh, what you're doing in the first place because you might not have the uh, expertise in it. Um, I, I, I want to I wanna kind of uh, go back to something uh, you said earlier, Anne. It's interesting, right, because being informed, right, I'm being given correct information. But sometimes research lies, right? Deceives. I mean, some of the greatest psychological studies, right? And I don't know how exactly psychological studies fit into video game research, but they've got to fit into video oh, research yeah, in, sure. in lots of ways, right? Um, how much deception can I do in my in, in my research? That's a really good question. So let's think about, you know, let's say, well, I won't say in the IRB world, in human research world, we have these three core values core ethical principles. And we've talked about all of them here today. Informed consent is a big one. That's a value we have. Weighing risks and benefits. That's the second value we have. And then fairness and justice. That's the third value we have. So in the case that you just described, this idea of deceiving people in order to study them, um, we're, we're basically trying to weigh our value of informed consent against our value of, of, risk benefit, the benefit of that research of what you're going to learn, right? Mm -hmm. And so is it is it more valuable to learn the thing we're going to learn from this research, even though we're deceiving people? Or is it more valuable to get their informed consent? What do we value more? And so with every study, then we have to decide, are the benefits worth it? Mm. Is is that worth the deception? Now, In psychology research, you know, it is commonly accepted practice now that you don't just deceive people and then walk away. You deceive them, they do the the study, right? They do the thing you're asking them to do, and then you actually tell them that you deceived Mm. them before they walk away and tell them why you needed to deceive them in the first place. So you're Mm. actually getting informed consent later a little bit, right? Because even though they couldn't make that full decision up front, they are getting information later. And we ask our researchers then to respect people and say, if you hated what we did to you, you don't have, you can pull all your data from our research project, right? Um, And, you know, you have the right to voice that. So it's not a perfect way of getting informed consent, but it helps fill in some of the gaps um, that, that would cause people to feel like that was an ethically questionable practice in the first place. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, so that brings into question, there's a lot of stuff that happens in games, particularly now that, you know, mobile games and other connected games where um, uh, where the game itself is in some ways a, a giant test, right? Uh, and, and people test all kinds of things. There's A-B testing for, for UI issues. Like, in some ways, these are psychological tests, right? Like, does this, does this interface work better for doing whatever it is that we're, we're attempting to do than this other interface. And we're going to test half of our population of, you know, 30,000 gamers, um, what they, you know, uh, against one and, and then the other 30,000 against the other. And we get a lot of good data out of this stuff and get a lot of good information. Um, you know, and every game has its terms of, uh, its terms that you, you know, check the box off and not read. But is that, should that be something that we should really consider through these through the same lens that the IRB do? Oh, I see. So just just to be clear, so these would be just kind of practical research that the game itself does, right? Yeah. Uh, continually, right? And continuously, in terms of, absolutely. Right, you're getting feedback from users very, very. Uh, I mean, directly or indirectly, I guess you could always you know ask them after the fact. So no, it's we're not just going... getting we're just getting it directly. We're just seeing seeing what they do in the game, and we're and we're collecting that data. Right. So yeah, it's, yeah I'd love to hear that. Yeah. How is this different from what you guys do, and are there any lessons uh, that uh, you think game companies should take from this? Yeah. So that is. Um... 
the product development type angle. So one of the mm -hmm. ways I think about this, and I, I don't know that there's, you know, I don't know that this is in the Belmont report, right? <laughs> I don't know that this is officially documented, but I tend to think about things in terms of intervention in the psychological sense in, in terms of user testing and mm. how much we are impacting, changing, or uh, messing with people's natural behaviors. So if, for example, I want to study um, people's reaction to, uh, a virtual world in one version where sight is very limited and audio is more apparent and in another version where sight is there but there's no audio track something like that where i'm introducing a change i'm having them play and then introducing this change and then and seeing the results um i'm impacting them by introducing this change in a minor way that's not going to presumably cause anyone any psychological distress or any kind of harm um Whereas if I have someone uh, play like a very cutesy, colorful game and all of a sudden a giant scary monster comes out to scare them and because I'm introducing the stimuli as a type of intervention to see how, I, I mean, I don't know why you'd want to do this research unless you're doing something biometrically, right? You want to see how uh, fast you can make someone's heart rate go up. <laughs> that could be. That's very mm -hmm. cruel, but fun. Um, that's a little bit more serious. Now I'm impacting them. I'm impacting their physicality. Uh, I am intentionally disrupting what they are setting out to do. So I think in terms of when companies are collecting tel telemetry, telemetry um, and, and they're collecting analytical data from their users, their users are playing the game as intended. They're playing the product that they purchased. Uh, mm -hmm. Of course, okay. So maybe maybe they have some complaints about this product as users. Uh, you know, we, we've all been on Reddit before. But they're, <laughs> they purchased this product. They're playing this product. They're happy to play this product. Now, sending data to the company about pinch points where the user is dying, sending data to the company about how much in-game currency they've earned uh, and how much they've spent to find out if the economy is balanced. All of these things are are fairly innocuous. They're they're for the benefit of the game and for the benefit of the game's balancing and and presumably to make that person even happier with the game the next time they play it, um, because it'll be more more balanced uh, and more theoretically more enjoyable, um, which is different to intentionally disrupting someone's gameplay to see how they react. Right. Well, what about things like because we we've certainly heard a lot of stories about. Um, using A-B testing to see which things will lead people to buy more in-game purchases. Oh, uh, marketing. Oh, marketing. <laughs> uh, so it, in terms of what, what would be the question? Yeah. Could, should, we, should we be using the lens of that, uh, that Anne talks about for the, the, that the IRB use for doing these sorts of things as well? That is a really... I think you can. Question. Sorry, Ashley, I, I think you can. One of the things that I teach um, and, and why it's probably particularly interesting that my bio starts with the fact that I'm a sewist and I love to sew is I actually um, have kind of taken on um, some projects where I go out into what you would think are completely unrelated fields like sewing and artistry. You would think it's unrelated to research ethics. And I actually go and I talk about how our three core ethical principles we, we use all over our lives in lots of different fields and in lots of different ways. And so I think it's really easy to, to look at things like informed choices, risk, benefit, balance, and justice across all the things that we do. They're, they're just great ethical principles to, to mm -hmm. weigh with all of our decisions that we're making. And so when you're looking at, you know, say studying different ways you would advertise to people to get them to make purchases, you know, you absolutely can say, what's the, what's the risk to the person and to society here? What's the benefit to the person in society here? Are the burdens and the benefits equitably distributed? Is it a just way, a fair way of doing things? So even though that, that type of an activity doesn't need to be reviewed by an IRB, thank the Lord above. Um, mm. <laughs> it is something that you can still apply ethics to. You can still, you know, use these principles to make better decisions. If, if you know, if you're trying to make the world more ethical, you would absolutely be able to do that. And sorry, Ashley, I cut you off. Please. Oh, I was take. just going to 
say from a very practical standpoint, you have this idea of, well, are you making people spend more money or were those people going to spend that money anyway and you've just made it easier for them because your user interface is more aligned to how people think. It's more intuitive, right? Mm -hmm. um, do I mean, I don't know of a, a causal relationship to to having a particular aesthetic design that causes people to spend more money. Um, I do know that you want to, a good, good user experience design practice says that you want to limit the amount of barriers that exist for people to be able to spend their money. I mean, I have examples of, I was trying to get a food delivery app, um, like a, a box, uh, the box of groceries that's delivered to your house. And yeah. I tried two different apps and I couldn't figure out how to give them my money. Like I wanted this service. Oh. I was a client, like, let's go. I got my credit card in hand, but your UI is so terrible that I cannot figure Oof. out how to order my first box. I am not going to use your service. So when we're talking about like the, 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 convert, the conversion between the number of people who download a game or an app and the number of people who pay for the game or the app, we, we're looking at how much of that is people getting frustrated and closing it and uninstalling it because they can't figure out how to do what they want to do. That might right. not necessarily always be give someone money, right? Your UI might be terrible and people get frustrated not being able to play the game in general sure. and then close the app and, and never convert to a paying customer. But but I, I totally echo and uh, agree with Anne as well that in terms of dark design practices, there we absolutely can implement this moral framework. Um, I just wanted to be careful to suss out the kind of practicalities of user interface design is not, and user experience design is not always to, to fleece people. <laughs> you know, right, game right. devs no, gotta eat, <laughs> we gotta right. make money. That's right, and it might not even be your, 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 your business model, right? It might be, you know, the way that you serve ads or the way that you do anything. But but we do a lot of this sort of testing all the time, as was was my point. And I, it was sort of I was sort of struck by how the descriptions of these of these psychological tests mapped over to this this kind of A B testing that we do in games and other apps. It, it's all interesting the time. with the with the A P with the A B testing also whether you guys have demographics of the uh, of it, whether these are just players or whether you have information that gives you demographics on these players and how oh, that yeah. would, you know, how how that would would play into it. I was thinking, Ashley, with your example, I was thinking of uh, you know all these games that have uh, ads in the middle to get you to buy other games and how hard it is for me to find the X to shut them off or those two little arrows to forward them and how you can essentially do a b testing where the button is just a little tiny bit smaller or yet in another place that's even harder to find and, and again uh i think the way Anne explained it is okay you know what's the potential harms here right how does that uh, weigh against the benefits i thought i thought i, I thought and that was really great just uh yeah. you know how you could apply it uh yeah to i kind of love this, this as just thing. a set of lenses that we should look at, we should look at all this stuff through, maybe. Totally agree, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this. So um, probably the most famous uh, topics of research, right, uh, on video games uh, are the ones that have made it to the public discussion, right? Uh, they're about, uh, you know, violence, sexism, and addiction, right? That's been kind of the, the big three, right? Um, you know, uh, I want to know if an uh, ultraviolet video game, whatever exactly that means, uh, you know, but let's say a very violent video game, right, um, is going to actually uh, lead to violence, right? And um, I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, you guys, or at least Ashley, has a, some understanding of the history, uh, you know, of, of this. But... Um, you know, I, I remember re reading study on aggression and, you know, looking at how they were doing the study and thinking, my God, their sam number one, their sample is so small. Uh, but number two, uh, they were using the blast of horns, uh, right, to – so you're playing a game and whether – and you have this ability to blast a horn uh, that's going to be really loud in someone's face. And if you do that, that was a sign that you are aggressive. And I thought to myself, oh, my God, that is – ridiculous in terms of measuring aggression but of course you know you're limited right in what you can so you know how am i limited right is is well, I think it's really interesting that you bring up that they had such a small sample size because in some, in some, I mean, yes, in terms of your 
I was thinking research. of a particular study I was looking at. Yeah, but I'm yeah, sure, yeah. I'm sure there's some with large pe- sample sizes. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, no. I know the exact study you mean, and I oh. can't remember the name of the authors at the moment. But um, it's it's really interesting because, in, of course, when we're doing a, a research design, we if we're doing it quantitatively, we want as many people as possible. But it's, I'm always heartened a little bit when you have these wild studies where you're like, what? And you see that they have a small sample size because it means that the IRB is working, right? Because people did not consent to participate in that research. Um, I mean, I'm always floored by pain management studies where people, I mean, it's not, they're not like inflicting permanent harm, but, but you see them all the time where people hold an ice cube, um, which is discomfort, right? Or they will snap rubber bands on their arm or they will expose skin to heat or cold. And then, determine how effective an analgesic is or an anesthetic or whatever the the intervention is to try and um, you know not feel that pain and every time I I read one of these I just think who in the hell would want to do this but as as an undergrad uh, I I participated in you know uh, clinical trials because I needed the money and as I totally would have held an ice cube for money Right. You know, people who need money would be, would be my, my guess. Right. Yeah. So for for our research ethics, it comes down to if, if you would do it for money and if that seems reasonable to you, you we respect you as a person. We respect your ability to consent to that. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Although we do have to make the decision of like how much pain are we willing to let you choose to inflict on yourself? at your own expense. So even though you might be a competent adult, right. There might be a threshold of risk that we as an IRB, we're not okay with you choosing that amount of risk, you know, whether it's for money or, you know, whatever the result could be disability after that risk is taken. Um, one of the, one of the things that I thought about with this question, um, and this is a really somber topic, unfortunately, but I think it's a really good example, is um, studies about child abuse. Mm. So I think we can all agree that figuring out how to reduce child abuse in our society is a great thing to figure out. And yet mm-hmm. we don't want to do any studies where we're actually abusing children. Um, right. That's that's not the goal, Right. And yet we need to study it. And so the way we design our studies is actually how we address kind of the the issues of of risk and benefit here, right? I'm not going to design a study that abuses children. That's not right. However, I could design a study that observes child abuse behavior that's happening out in the real world environment, right? And, And then study, you know, things that go along with that observation. I think it's the same with violent video game research. If there is the hypothesis that violent video games are causing people to be violent, which is questionable, but if that's Mm -hmm. your hypothesis, then you need to go about studying that in a way that doesn't increase harm to people. And so perhaps it's, again, when we talked about this earlier, you don't go and expose naive video game players who have never played a violent video game to all these violent video games and then see what happens. Um, But there are a lot of people out there that are already playing violent video games that there's a pool um, to potentially observe and study. Now, the science of, you know, how we measure their progression toward violence or not is is very interesting in and of itself. And correlation versus causation is also, I think, an interesting um, thing to think about here that we have to be careful as scientists. But um, I think it's important to really say, like, what am I really trying to study here? What's the social problem I'm really trying to understand and maybe we're trying to benefit from? And then how do I make sure that I am not just harming people for the sake of harming people to answer my question? Yeah, that's yeah. great. Uh, you know, though, though it does make me think the study actually I was thinking about, and Ashley, I don't know if we we're thinking about the same study or if there's lots of studies that do this, but one of the things that they did want to know is they wanted to know the difference between people who do play uh, violent games. Uh, and I remember how violent we're talking about, or maybe it was just first-person shooters. or, But they did want to know the difference between people who play regularly and people that don't play. So they can see if, uh, you know, if you're more desensitized to violence or anything like that. And so they did do that. But 
again, I'm curious if that was maybe they were playing Call of Duty as opposed to like Manhunter or something. Yeah, sure. Or, right. So that's uh, and and that's when we're talking about also adults versus kids is another one that seems really interesting there. Speaking of, um, you know, one of the big concerns with kids is pathological play and addiction. A study designed for addictive behavior. S how do you do that, uh, you know, ethically? Uh, do the design? That's between you and God. <laughs> <laughs> In terms of do the research, um, that's, again, like Anne said, that's something that the IRB wouldn't have to deal with because it's product research, thank goodness, because that's mm. a that's an ethical landmine. Um, I, I think it really goes back to thinking about the core principles and in your your the why are you doing the study? Are you doing the study to make a profit? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's mm -hmm. some people value that, right? That's not something that I value, and I I would not <laughs> I would not participate or uh, run a study uh, according to what's going to line my pockets. Um, but you know, if are you doing it because you're a small indie company and you're trying to make it big? I mean, that's that's a little bit more relatable, a little bit more sympathetic, uh, we can mm -hmm. we can say. Um, I want to make it big by creating addicts out of my players so they'll spend a lot of money. Or <laughs> but, I've, I've, I've created a, a, a mechanic that I'm worried might be addicting, and I don't want to do this. Or I'm, a, oh, I'm a psycho, or I'm a psychologist who is concerned about addiction and w just wants to know this for the sake of knowledge. So how can you do that ethically? Well, make sure that your participants know that what they're signing up for, that they know that there's the potential that they could become addicted. Um, and make sure you have some sort of onboarding and deboarding process where you can break them of that addictive habit and or provide support in terms of therapy or addiction counseling uh, for them afterwards should they you know, actually become dependent on on this particular mechanic, I'd say. What do you think, Anne? Yeah, I think one of the ways that we reduce risk isn't necessarily by preventing it, but maybe by treating it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, with those additional offerings of services that it's like we as researchers aren't trying to research how you partake of these services later, but we're trying to do good by you as the person who was in our study. If we can help you based on something that we've learned and and leave you better off than when you came here, or at least try to leave you better off, then, you know, maybe we've done our duty to help you and to help ourselves as researchers, right, to gain that knowledge. I have to say, I mean, this conversation really gave me um, respect for how hard it is, practical ethical research on some of the most controversial topics in video games. Yeah, I, I agree. And I and I feel like I've come away with a with a new set of lenses that I can I can apply. One thing to be clear about, though, um, is that because it's difficult and I don't in terms of like the paperwork, I don't think it is that difficult. I think it's more about the thought experiments and thinking through your research design in a in an ethical way that's challenging but you should still do it not only because it makes you a better person but because that research study researching controversial things is really important the the more um ethical kind of alarm bells that sound isn't necessarily a deterrent. It means you're thinking the right things, you're asking the right mm. questions, and you're putting your participants first and thinking about your research design. But it, it shouldn't dissuade you from doing that research. It should just help encourage you to do that research ethically. And your local institutional review board, in whatever form that takes, is friendly and, and there to help you. Uh, I, for some reason, I think on campuses in particular, IRBs get this reputation for being this like draconic, uh, you know, bureaucracy that's just there to ruin your day. <laughs> and we're really not. We want to see you be successful because that, that, you know, we're researchers too. And we're really excited to generate knowledge. It's really important to us. Awesome. I was going to ask you guys if, if there was anything else that you guys think the, our listeners should know about the ethics of research on human subjects involving video games. And I think, Ashley, that was that was a Great answer to that already, unless you want to add anything to it. And Anne, we'd love to hear from you as well. I have one quick thing to add yeah. um, that so much of research ethics is just not taught. Uh, so this is not necessarily ethics and games, but when I have students come through my user research class and, and I tell them about research ethics and they... Um, 
you know, they don't necessarily say this out loud because they're very kind, sweet people and they wouldn't hurt my <laughs> feelings. But I get the kind of, well, why should we be learning about this? We're just studying video games. And Anne made a point earlier that our, our history with research ethics in this country is absolutely atrocious. And I, I would encourage everyone to, when, when they have the spoons... <laughs> <laughs> which might not be anytime soon because the world is difficult. But there is a book called Medical Apartheid by Harriet Washington. And as part of my my own self-improvement work for Black History Month, um, I decided to read that book. It deals with race, particularly um, the unfair, unjust, and disproportionate amount of uh, medical research that has uh, been done on black people um, throughout the United States history with without consent. And it, I mean, full, full disclosure, it is a dark, dark book. It is something that you need to prepare yourself for and, and do when you're in a good headspace for sure, because it is, we have a lot to be, uh, to be ashamed of in terms of our, our history, but it's very important that we know it. And if I could add on to that, you know, examining our history is really important. It, it's brought us to where we are and it's helped us, helped us to make better ethical decisions. However, what's really interesting about video game research is how fast the technology changes. You all know this. Um, mm -hmm. And when technology changes fast, our ability to keep up ethically kind of struggles. So mm -hmm. one of the things IRBs have to grapple with is that changing landscape of what's acceptable, what's ethical, what's fair, um, because our society changes just like the technology changes. And so I would just encourage everybody to look at the potential for the future of being able to sit with ourselves and and, and apply these ethical lenses um, to how video game research changes over time, what new research questions are gonna come up because of that, but maybe also what new ethical quandaries are we going to be put in because of it? And that's what I feel is incredibly interesting um, mm -hmm. about my field of, of study and, and what I do day to day, but it's also imperative that if we're not going to repeat history by treating people badly, we need to continue to question the status quo and move the ethical conversation as fast as the technology is moving to. Oh, well said. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. We hard agree. All right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And Johnson, Ashley Guarado, uh, thank you so much for, uh, for coming on the show. We really, really appreciate it. Yay. Thank you um, so much for having us. All right. Absolutely. Great podcast. Uh, play nice, everybody. <laughs>